Hello, this is Paul Callahan, the Head of Employment Law at Taylor West Union London. Welcome to our first Employment Law webinar of 2020. We're going to be looking at the employment law and Brexit changes that are about to happen in the world of employment law and immigration law. Things have very much moved on since our last webinar. We now know that the UK is going to finally leave the EU at the end of January, the, uh, the end of January so not, not long at all to go. And we also know there are going to be a number of some qu quite significant changes to employment law that are coming into force in April. And what they mean almost certainly, and you'll hear from, from my colleagues, are that you, any templates of contracts of employment that you currently use are almost certainly going to need to be changed because of new requirements about what's in contracts. If you have any workers, so employees who are, so people who are not employees but are independent contractors but are in that intermediate category of worker, they're going to be going to have to be given a far more detailed statement of their terms and conditions. And super importantly, the new tax rules for consultants who you might contract with through service companies force in April, and that means that you as the end user will become liable for their taxes even though they will still probably be self-employed. And that's massive because there's a process to be gone through in order to notify those people who then have a right to object to what you're proposing to do. But the key point is that the UK revenue will make you as the end user liable for all taxes and potentially be huge wrong. And if you still pay these people gross. So it's, there's some really big news essentially. 2020. To get things going, I'm going to hand over to um, two of my to two of my associates, um, Nadine Simpson Ataha and Callum McCauley, who are going to who are going to focus in on some of the key changes about to happen. So Nadine, over to you. Thank you, Paul. So yeah, there are quite a few changes you need to know about that are coming in in April this year, and to try and help you in terms of your priority to do list. Um, Callum and I are going to run through them in relation to um, order of importance. So first up, the first change that is going to hit budget straight away um, is that termination payments are becoming more expensive. So this is a hangover from last year. It's expected to come into effect in April 2019. It was delayed and now, unless something changes between now and April, it's due to come into effect on 6th of April this year. So what is actually happening? Um, the difference that has come into play is that at the moment, um, if you have part of a payment and termination package that is not from employment, so that's what we most commonly refer to as an ex-gratia payment or compensation for loss of office, that payment is exempt from income tax up to a value of £30,000. Anything above that, as you know, is subject to income tax. Now, what the change, what's coming to effect on the 6th of April is that anything above that £30,000 threshold will not only be subject to income tax, it would also be subject to national employer contributions. So that is 13.8% of any value over the £30,000 threshold, which employers will be liable to pay. So if you have anyone that you are looking at settling out of the business on or after 6th of April 2020, you'll be hit by this. Equally, if you have someone who you've already set out of the business, but you may have an arrangement in a settlement agreement for staggered payments over a course of time, if any one of those payments occurs on or after 6th of April 2020, it will also be caught by this new rule. So just something to have in mind when you're costing out potential exits and exits that you still have payments ongoing for. Thanks, Nadine. So the, the first point that I'm covering, as, as Paul has mentioned, is uh, changes to the, the statement of employment particulars that are currently required under Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act, um, which set out the basic employment relationship uh, between employers and their currently employees. Um, so at the moment, this uh, Section 1 statement uh, particulars needs to be given to employees, uh, and it, it incorporates basic information like pay, date of continuous employment, hours of work, that kind of thing. Uh, and usually uh, this statement is containing the contract of employment that's given to employees uh, on or around the first day of employment. Um, 
So as Paul mentioned, there are a couple of really important changes coming into effect on the 6th of April uh, in relation to this statement uh, that needs to be provided. So the, the, the first is that uh, the obligation to provide a Section 1 statement is going to be extended uh, and will apply not, not only to just employees as it does now, but, but also to uh, all of your workers as well. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, it will cover uh, you know, work workers that aren't independent contractors or aren't f uh, full employees, so agency workers or, or temporary workers on zero-hour contracts. Um, so from the 6th of April 2020, in relation to those individuals, you'll need to think about getting compliant contracts, uh, Section 1 compliant contracts, I I in place uh, in respect of them. Uh, the, the, the second point to note, uh, important point to note, is that the information that is uh, required to be included in the statement is, is going to be expanded as well. Uh, so the statement of terms as of the 6th of April will now need to include the information that's up on the slide there. Um, so we need to make reference uh, not only to the hours of work that it currently needs to make reference to, but also uh, the days of the week the work is required to work, um, whether any hours are variable and, and how that variation is to be determined. Um, it also needs to make reference to uh, details relating to paid leave over and above normal holiday pay, so that's things like maternity and paternity leave entitlements. Um, benefits that aren't already uh, included in the statement, so things like life insurance. Um, so so that on that point we might need to think slightly further ahead than, than usual in terms of any benefits that are being provided and, and refer to these in the contract uh, it, it itself. Um, probationary period as well. Um, and that, that will need to include any conditions attached to the probationary period uh, and its duration. Uh, Carol, is it right that, it, that even if you don't have a probationary period, that now needs to be stated? Uh, yes, so um, as, as Paul has said, um, with, with your probationary period, um, at the moment we would include it in the contract and, and say uh, that the, the, the need for it is, is optional and you, it's at the employer's discretion, but as of the 6th of April, uh, even if you don't have a probationary period in place, this is something that we'll need to reference uh, in the statement. So that, that's a change that's, that's coming in as well. Uh, and then the final point is um, we'll need to reference any training entitlement that's being provided and whether or not that's uh, mandatory or, or, or needs to be paid for by the worker uh, or the employee. Um, and then the other change... Uh, which, which is uh, really important with, with, with the Section 1 statement, uh, is when exactly the statement <coughs> should be provided. Uh, so it's no longer a requirement that uh, the individual ha have worked for at least one month before a Section 1 statement needs to be provided, so there's essentially no service requirement on it anymore. Um, and uh, now the written particulars will need to be provided no later at the beginning so it's essentially a day one right, uh, which is a change from the current rules because at the moment you're, you're able to give this statement to your employees uh, up to two months after they've started employment. Um, so the information in the statement will also need to be included in a single document uh, rather than is the case where currently you can kind of put certain particulars in a handbook or, or on your intranet. So that's another thing we, we think about. Um, but but the, the, the takeaway point for all of the new rules is that most of the content um, that will need to be given to employees and workers in the Section 1 statement will need to be given in a single document uh, on day one of employment. And what that means for you is that for all of your employees who are starting on or after the 6th of April, um, if you have any employment contracts currently that are templates, that they'll need to be updated so that when you hire new employees or workers going forward, um, the, the contracts that you're giving them are, are compliant with the new rules. So, exactly. So, existing employees you don't need to worry about. It's not, that, it's not as if they all need a new contract. You do have a template that you for anyone you, you really need to be updated because they're not going to be compliant. From and just, just on that point about existing employees, um, you, you, you don't need to provide them, provide them with a compliance statement, but if they make a request for one, uh, then you'll need to respond to that request within a month. So that's just a, a point to bear in mind as well. So next up is holiday pay, everyone's favourite topic, um, but another rule is being added to how holiday pay should be calculated. 
So this new rule is only relevant if you have people who work atypically. So, for example, if you provide a certain number of hours of work per week, but that person um, decides how they work those hours during the week. Or if you have people who have set hours, but they get varied pay depending on the amount of the work that they do or the times or the days on which they work. So I don't know if you have, for example, an evening shift premium or something like that, this would apply. So what is the change? The change is all to do with how we calculate a week's pay. As you will know, people are entitled to a week's pay for a week's leave. Now, at the moment, a week's pay is calculated by averaging basic pay and any relevant overtime or commission earned in the 12 working weeks before a person goes on holiday. From 6th of April this year, you'll need to look back over the past 52-week period before the person goes on holiday, or if they've worked for less than a year for the entire time they've worked for you. Um, and that's removing any weeks that a worker, the person hasn't earned any money, and that will be the, the basis to calculate average weekly pay. Now, the whole kind of aim of the government behind this is to try to ensure that people aren't disadvantaged if they take holiday at a quiet time when their weekly pay might be lower. So the thinking is that this will um, provide a improvement for the pe for some people who, who work atypically, um, and that's the reason for this change. It's something that's been in the pipeline pre the new government coming in, um, but it's being carried through regardless. So this is just something to be wary of so that you can flag it with payroll providers if they're not already flagging it to you, um, because if it is relevant to your workforce, that is something that you will want to make sure is being implemented from 6th of April. Um, otherwise, you could find yourself in a position dealing with um, frustrating potential claims in the future. Uh, the next change to consider is a new right to uh, statutory leave and in certain circumstances pay on parental bereavement. So currently there's no legal requirement for uh, bereavement leave or pay um, and, and this is usually just something that's at the discretion of, of the employer and uh, the length of time that any employer allows for periods of leave in these circumstances kind of varies from employer to employer. Um, that, that all let, looks set to change as of the 6th of April 2020. Um, with the Parental Bereavement Leave and Pay Act, um, which came into force in late 2018, detailing uh, th this new entitlement. Uh, it, we don't have all of the specifics on this yet, but the government responded to a consultation uh, in late 2018 on this, um, and they're expected to lay regulations <coughs> soon, finalising the exact details. Um, but th the main points to consider uh, that we know at the moment are broadly set out on uh, the slide. So. Um, the entitlement covers, will cover both legal parents and primary carers, so it will include people like legal guardians and, and step parents as well, uh, and it will give them the right to two weeks leave to take away from the workplace uh, on the death of a child under the age of 18 or, or still births taking place after 24 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, the, the leave can either be taken in one single block of two weeks or, or two separate blocks of one week, uh, but, but can't be taken in, in any other way. Uh, and it will be able to be taken by employees uh, up to 56 weeks uh, after the death of the child. Um, for the leave to be paid, there, there will be a service requirement, uh, so parents uh, must have at least 26 weeks service uh, with their employer in order for it to be paid, and, and the leave will be paid at a statutory rate, which uh, is yet confirmed, but the uh, we expect will will be in, in due course. Uh, and just a, a, a quick mention on notice requirements, and this is just based on the government's uh, response to the consultation on this, and, and they're not yet to confirm anything, but um, our, our understanding at the moment is that if the leave is taken relatively shortly after the death of, of the child, then uh, all the employee will need to do is simply inform their employer that they're taking the leave uh, and no notice period will be required. Uh, but, but for leave taken at a slightly later date, so maybe if you're getting closer towards that 56 week cutoff, then um, it, it looks like there will be a need for employees to give uh, a notice period and that, that looks like it will be uh, one week's notice. Uh, but as I said, all, all of these um, time periods are subject. Confirmation by the government. 
So next on your changes priority list um, is a change in relation to agency workers. So it's stating the obvious, but this only needs to be on your list if you use agency workers or if you're considering doing so in the future or if your business itself supplies workers to hirers for temporary work. So the practical points that you need to be aware of. From 6th of April, again, uh, you need to make sure that people you engage via an agency are paid the same amount as people you engage direct if they're with you for 12 weeks or more. Um, and the require, there will be a requirement to tell agency workers about this change in law by 30th of April this year. Um, so if you know what the Swedish derogation is, that's because you're familiar with this area. The whole reason for this change and the need to take these practical steps is because the Swedish derogation is being abolished from law. It hasn't been working in the way that it's intended. Um, as part of the Taylor Review and Good Work Plan, it was considered that it's time to get rid of that. So essentially, it means that you'll need to provide pay parity um, to agency workers if they're with you continuously in a role um, for 12 weeks or more as of the 6th of April. There is an additional side requirement that's also being introduced, um, and that's a requirement to give specific key information to work seekers before agreeing terms. So this is only relevant if you are a business yourself that supplies workers to hire us for temporary work. Um, and that statement, not quite as descriptive as the Section 1 statement that Callum has talked you through, but it does require you to, for example, give an illustrative um, scenario of expected level of take-home pay, take into account your fees, deductions, rate of pay, etc. So um, if you are a business in that area, then please let us know that's something we can assist with. Um, but yeah, as I said, if, if you're not a business that operates in this field, you can politely ignore um, this from your priority list and, and move on to what's next. On to one that, that we all can't ignore. Uh, so this is a quick note on the uh, national living wage and national minimum wage. Um, the, uh, obviously, the national minimum wage has, has been around since the, the late 90s, and the national living wage was introduced um, as a premium to this in, in 2016. So this is something that uh, in the UK we should all be familiar with now. Uh, and, and as of the 6th of April 2020, um, there is going to be an increase in this, uh, as there has been kind of year on year. Uh, since it was introduced, um, but but this year in in particular, there's an increase um, that's slightly bigger than than what we've seen in the past. So uh, the, the the headline point is is on the slide there. So um, the national living wage, which applies to uh, employees and workers who are over the age of 25, is is going to increase by 6.2% uh, uh, and will be increased to £8.72 uh, per hour um, from the 6th of April. Um, we've included a link there for other categories of worker um, which the national minimum wage will apply to and, and that's uh, kind of younger age categories and, and there's a, a staggered um, a, a approach to that so you, you can take a look at that in your own time. Um, looking further forward into the future on this one as well, the, the government has announced that um, it expects that the national living wage uh, will rise um, fairly significantly over the next four years to, to a point at which it will be uh, approximately £10.50 per hour by uh, 2024. Um, so th this is one just to keep an eye on going forward, um, it, particularly if you have any employees or workers that you think are kind of hovering around uh, this level of pay. Um, if, if you have any concerns at all, it would be a good time in the lead up to the 6th of April just to do a quick audit of uh, your, your pay for any any low paid workers that you you have, uh, just to check that uh, as as this increase comes into force, you won't be falling uh, foul of of the rules, um, and and that's particularly the case given that um, there's a kind of fairly robust enforcement carried out by HMRC, uh, and, and penalties can include uh, anything from being kind of named and shamed to notices of underpayment. So this is something that. Um, Whilst I'm sure it is not uh, intentionally um, kind of breached on on the case of any of you, it's something that potentially might kind of slip under the radar. So we just wanted to flag that one uh, to you as well. So I'll pass over to 
today now to talk about the IR35 regime. Hi everyone. Um, so, I mean, I suspect you may have already heard about the uh, the changes to the IR35 tax rules, um, and, and as Paul mentioned, they, they're going to be quite significant for businesses um, in the UK who, who engage contracts. Um, both from sort of a financial and an additional sort of administrative burden. Um, so, uh, if we take a look at the first slide, so essentially what IR35 is a set of tax rules which are going to be relevant if you if you do engage self-employed contractors who operate through a personal service company. Um, and it's essentially what the rules are uh, designed to do is prevent contractors who, who operate through these, these limited companies from paying less tax if the reality is that if you took away the, the personal service company, um, the relationship between the individual contractor and the end user client um, looks more like an employment relationship as opposed to a genuine self-employed um, self uh, consultancy relationship. Um, and if, if it does look more like an employment relationship, then that arrangement will fall inside IR35 and deductions for tax and national insurance contributions need to be made from the fee paid to the uh, to the personal service company. Um, so one thing just to bear in mind is that IR35 is, um, is a set of tax rules and not employment or employment law rules for, for the purposes of employment status. So um, in theory, it's possible that someone could be deemed to be an employee for tax purposes, but not an employee for employment law purposes. Um, there's there's a, there's a quite significant overlap between the tests for empl employment status for tax and for employment law purposes, but um, but they're not identical, so uh, it doesn't automatically follow that you know finding that a, a contract arrangement is within IR35 means that the individual is an employee or a worker for the purposes of employment law um, employment law rights such as you know, holiday pay and national minimum wage. Um, if we just move on to the current position, so under the current IR35 rules, um, and, and for today's purposes, we'll just sort of focus on a simple contractor uh, arrangement. So the end user client contracts with the personal service company, um, and it can get uh, slightly more complicated if there are sort of entities um, in between, um, you know, agencies in the supply chain. But but we'll just focus on the sort of a simple chain for today's purposes. Um, so under the current rules, if you take away the personal service company and the, you look at the hypothetical relationship between the individual, individual co contractor and the end user client, if that's deemed to be more akin to an employment relationship, then um, the arrangement would fall inside IR35 and currently the responsibility for assessing that position and then making any necessary deductions for tax and national insurance contributions um, is on the personal service company, so the contractor. Um, and if they should have declared themselves as being inside IR35 and they haven't, then the, uh, the contractor again bears the responsibility and the liability for any unpaid taxes um, that might be due and, and any sort of interest and potential penalties on that. Um, so you currently, um, up, you know, up until the 6th of April, the end user client has no responsibility to sort of assess uh, the employment status of the contractor or make any necessary deductions. Um, the position, if we look at the position from the 6th of April, so quite quite significant changes, um, and they do reflect changes which which already apply in the public sector. Um, so there's going to be a quite significant change, of, a shift of responsibility away from the contractor and on to the end user client. So that's that's you if you engage if you engage contractors through um, a personal service company, um, and that essentially means that the the, the so the end user client is, a, is, a, is the client to whom the services um, are ultimately provided. Um, and what, what that means is that the responsibility for making that assessment of the employment status of the individual contractor um, and communicating that decision um, is, is on you, the end user client. And if, if you determine that the arrangement does fall within the IR35 rules, 
then the, the responsibility for making those deductions for tax and national insurance contributions will will also be on you, the, the client. Um, and it, it, it also means that there'll be primary liability for any incorrect taxes, so any unpaid taxes which should have been paid, um, and then potentially any um, interest and penalties will, will also be on you, the end user client. Um, so, as I said, quite quite significant difference there for, for businesses. It, it does involve you, the client, having to assess the arrangement um, and make a determination on, on what's notoriously quite a, diff, a tricky area of law, um, and then sort of, and then communicate that decision to to the uh, contractor. So in terms of the uh, making that assessment of their employment status, um, there, there, is, there is a process to it. Um, so you, the end user client, need to carry out this assessment um, with reasonable care. Um, we, we don't have much guidance so far um, as to what reasonable care is, but it, it will um, no doubt be to, to make sort of an honest assessment based um, on a case-by-case -case basis, so no sort of blanket determinations across the board. And then in terms of the assessment itself, um, this will be sort of based on the, the test for employment status under the under the tax rules. And as, as I mentioned earlier, that's not exactly the same as the uh, the test under employment law rules, but um, it, it's very broadly speaking based on factors such as you know the level of mutuality of obligation, the extent to which there's supervision or direction or control over the individual co contractor, um, whether that person has to provide the services personally or do they have a right of substitution. So those are just sort of some of the factors you take into account. Um, so, I mean, it is a sort of a notoriously difficult area of law, and that's a very much overview of some of the factors. Um, we have prepared a checklist of, you know, some of the questions which you, you might ask yourself as a starting point. Um, so if you, if you do need further help on that, do, do feel free to get in contact. Um, HMRC does also have um, an online tool which can be used, so it's the Check Employment Status Tool, or CEF. Um, it, I mean, it comes with a bit of a health warning. It's it come under some criticism um, as, as, you know, being a bit strict or, or um, unreliable and not sort of taking into account the nuances of, of these arrangements and practice. Um, but, um, but helpfully, if, if you do sort of um, go through the questions using the CEF tool and um, you, you get a determination that says you fall out, outside of the IR35 rules, then um, HMRC have said that you can you can rely on that um, that outcome in in, sort of in further correspondence with HMRC, provided the information you, you initially um, provided doesn't change and the answers are accurate. Um, so once you've once you've come to a determination and gone through the, the, the assessment um, on the employment status of the the individual contractor. You're then required to notify the contractor of your determination, um, and the individual does have a right to object. So if they do try to challenge that and disagree, so if you've said, you know, we think this arrangement falls within IR35, we're going to start deducting income tax and national insurance contributions, and they disagree, they've got a right to object, um, and you will then have 45 days. Um, from, from when they object to it, to reconsider, you know, your assessment and then and respond either confirming you believe it falls inside R35 or not, and provide your reasons um, either way. Um, and then if the if the arrangement does involve other entities in the supply chain and the end user um, to whom the clients uh, the services are provided is not at the entity which pays the contractor, so if there's you know an agency. Uh, entity in between, then it is still you, the end user client, who's responsible for making the status determination statement, but the fee paying entity um, would be responsible for making those deductions. Um, in terms of which organisations these new rules apply to, um, because they're, they're so significant, there is an exemption for small companies. 
um, and the, I mean, the definition of small companies um, it, it can be quite complex, but essentially what it means is you know, if, if the company meets at least two of the uh, following three criteria, so it's an annual review of less than 10.2 million, a balance sheet which is not more than 5 million and 50 or fewer employees, then you know, if you meet two of those, you, you do fall within the small company exemption and wouldn't have to um, comply with the, with the new rules going forward. Um, if you are part of a group of companies, um, so you know, if, you, if the parent company is in the US and there's a UK subsidiary, um, and the UK subsidiary meets the definition of a small company, but the parent company in the US, um, for example, or anywhere else, doesn't meet that definition, then the UK subsidiary is also not small for the purposes of the IR35 new rules. Um, Which is really key. So it basically means even if you've only got a handful of people and very little revenue in the UK, if, if a US or Canadian or Chinese or any other parent company would come within, uh, it, it would not come within that definition of small, then it applies to you. And that's absolutely key because I think a number of companies that are small in the UK might come within this exemption, where in fact they don't because they're, they're So what should you be doing to prepare? So, I mean, we, we generally you know, highly recommend forward planning given the, the changes are so significant um, for businesses, in particular the, sort of the HR and finance teams. I mean, it's going to involve making complex decisions on, on you know, tricky areas of law. Um, and actually since the beginning of January, we've seen a massive uptick. Well, we can help you do your assessment, but we... Process that you need to go through if they if, if they object, which is absolutely yeah, right. Given the potential. So I mean, as Paul said, yeah, it's good to start thinking about preparing for these new rules as soon as you know, as, as early as possible. Um, so some of the things you can be doing, I've set those out on the slide, but essentially it's um, you know, carrying out an audit of your current workforce and the extent to which you rely on contractors, you know, how many have you got, where are they engaged, what are they doing. Um, you know, recommend sort of carrying out a preliminary audit of, your, uh, of the contractor arrangements themselves. Um, to determine whether they're likely to fall within the, proposed, the, the new rules um, coming into force in April. So not just taking a look at the agreement itself, but, but really considering how the relationship operates in practice. Um, so what, what's the reality of the relationship? Is it more akin to employment or is it a genuine self-employed um, contract arrangement? Um, other things you can be doing is you know I mean, if you if you think that you know your contract arrangements might fall within the R I R thirty five uh, rules, you you might want to consider alternative arrangements. So you might just want to switch them onto an employment contract, um, or you could consider sort of using agencies within the supply chain. Um, so there's sort of various options, but um, it, it's definitely good to start thinking about these things early, and then. Um, importantly, sort of training and educating your HR teams and sort of management um, so that they're equipped to deal with these kind of issues and, and sort of know what to look out for. Um, so, I mean, other, other things to sort of bear in mind is that if, if you've got highly skilled contractors and um, you think they might fall within IR35, um, it, you know, you might, you might get them um, reviewing their pricing structures so that to, to take into account that their fees are going to be subject to tax and national insurance deductions. Um, so another thing to bear in mind for you, it, you know, it could be more expensive. Um, so just think, think about that in advance and think about budgeting. Um, and then that, I mean, that was just sort of a, a whistle stop tour of, of IR35 and, and the new changes. Um, and that if you do have any, any questions, we're sort of more than happy to, to, to help out. And we've got sort of Neto documentation as well. Um, and I think next up we've got uh, Charlie Pring, who's a, a senior counsel who's going to speak about the proposed immigration changes.
Hi everybody. So, so far we've been talking about um, employment law changes on the horizon. It's going to shift uh, focus a little bit to talk about corporate immigration, business immigration and how that um, might affect your business, whether you're small or large. Um, the same sort of changes are going to impact on you if you uh, employ uh, foreign workers. So. Um, We've got to start with Brexit because that's the most fundamental change to uh, the immigration system in the UK for, for several decades. Um, looking at the timeline in the next sort of 18 months or so, uh, as the team have already said, uh, almost certainly uh, the UK is leaving the EU on the 31st of January. Um, but actually, there will be a transition period until the end of 2020. So. As far as you're concerned and as far as your workforce are concerned, nothing is actually changing um, during this year. So um, from now onwards, and certainly, and certainly for the rest of 2020, you don't have to do anything differently in, in relation to hiring new employees or um, reviewing the status of your existing employees. The right to work checks um, won't be changing. Um, so you don't have to uh, do anything different with the way that you check immigration status of, of new hires. And um, during the rest of this year, European citizens can continue to move to the UK, work for your UK office without needing any sort of visa or immigration permission. Now, the end of the year, 31st of December 2020, is an important uh, cut-off point because that's the end of the transition period. Now, um, there is a scheme for EU citizens and their family members um, that are already in the UK, and that will be extended to anybody that arrives before the end of this year, so by 31 December. Um, they will be able to use the EU settlement scheme. About 2.5 million people have already applied to it through an online scheme. There's an app to verify your ID, and then you answer some questions, and you get a status, either a temporary status called pre-settled status, or a permanent status, uh, which is called settled status. Um, and anybody that arrives in the UK before the end of this year, so even if it's after Brexit date at the end of January, if they arrive before the end of this year, they will be able to use that scheme, um, which will allow them to uh, live and work in the UK, potentially indefinitely. Um, the 1st of January, so next year, is then a key date for a new immigration system. That's when we expect there to be a completely new system that will apply equally to European citizens and non-European citizens. So the position we've had for many years of uh, European citizens not needing visas to come and work in the UK, that will end, but only for people that are moving to the UK um, after that date. Those folks are already in the UK by the end of 2020, will be able to use the EU settlement scheme new workers coming to the UK uh, from next year onwards will need to qualify under the new immigration system that is to, still to be confirmed. Um, there's a report due out this month from an economic body that advises the UK government about what that's going to look like. The, 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 um, the, the expectation is it's going to be something like an Australian style points system. Um, which is uh, a system where you can score points for different attributes. Um, there was a lot of concern from employers that there would be a £30,000 salary threshold for all um, migrant workers to qualify under that scheme, which would, which would disqualify really important um, workers uh, across many different sectors. Actually, reports out today from the government suggest that that £30,000 limit is not going to apply and that um, workers will still be able to qualify for a visa with salaries under that threshold. But we need to wait and see what the detail of that scheme will look like. And then moving into the middle of next year, um, 30, 30th of June of 2021 is the deadline for European citizens to apply to the EU settlement scheme. But that's only for people that arrive and are living in the UK by the end of 2020. So they get a six month extra period. If you arrive right at the end of 2020, you've still got six months to apply, um, but, but you've got to do it by the 30th of June. So 
we, we've, we were just looking forward about the future system. Actually, I thought it would be useful to highlight one thing that's been a really positive change for employers, um, but actually it was something that, that happened last October, um, and it's really beneficial for Tier 2 sponsors, so companies in the UK, employers in the UK that have a, a sponsor license and sponsor work visas in Tier 2. Um, so if, for, for those of you that use Tier 2 General, that's the route that leads to permanent residency, typically used for external hires, um, you'll know that in many cases you have to conduct the resident labor market test or, or advertising to show that there are no suitably qualified local workers that could do the job before you sponsor in Tier 2. And one of the exemptions to having to do that is if the role appears on the shortage occupation list that's a list that the UK government, a list of jobs that the UK government accepts is in sort of dire um, shortage, and so so there's no point in employers advertising. Previously, it covered about one percent of jobs, um, but last October there was a, a huge expansion of that list, so it now covers nine, ten percent of of UK jobs. Um, and if you are recruiting for a role that appears on the shortage occupation list. Yes, you get the main. The main advantage is you get exemption from having to advertise the job, um, in the same way as you do if you're doing an intercompany transfer. But you're also exempt from a, a flat rate minimum salary for permanent residency applications. You get a slight discount on your visa fees, um, and also you'll know if you've come across applications against the cap, the UK's cap or quota in Tier Two General. Um, where, that, where, where demand exceeds the cap level, you get priority against everybody else if, if it's for a shortage occupation role. And so the sorts of jobs you'll see there are in the, in, in, in the columns on the right. Um, so for tech companies, um, one big change was that before, if you wanted to try and rely on the shortage occupation list, you needed a separate approval from the government to be a, a Digitech. Uh, sponsor that's gone, and all the conditions relating to that have gone. And um, all programmers, software developers, software engineers, web designers, um, IT business analysts, architects, systems designers, and cybersecurity specialists, everybody who does that job is now on the shortage occupation list. So you won't have to advertise if you recruit for them in Tier Two General. And you'll see there. There's also uh, every type of engineer is also now covered. Um, and there's some different um, uh, science roles as well uh, for those in, in, in that sector. But certainly in the tech space, our clients have seen a, 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 big, uh, a, big, a big improvement in the way that they can recruit. It saves time and money um, and makes the whole recruitment process a lot easier. So before we close, um, five things to take away, I think, as you're looking at your sort of immigration plans for the next year. Um, the first thing is to check in with your um, EU workers that you have in, in, in the UK and any British workers that you have in the EU to see if they need your support with Brexit around um, securing their status. Many European people in the UK have already applied to secure their status uh, because they found it's actually quite a straightforward process. But the, the key thing from the UK point of view is that you don't need to see evidence of their new status. You just need to let them know that you can support them if they need it. Um, and actually, uh, you know, the recommendation would be don't ask them for evidence of their new status for your existing workers. You will need to do that in the future from next year for new hires, but, but, um, but, but not your existing workers. Um, if you're planning international assignments um, in the next 18 months or so, can you, can you accelerate those assignments so that they start before the end of 2020? Because that's the key cutoff date for Brexit rights. So if the arrival date in either the EU or, to, or, 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 or the UK for, for European workers can be the end of the year, then they'll get a much easier route to stay. They won't need a visa. They'll, they'll have a sort of registration system through the Brexit process. If you have a Tier 2 sponsor license, we were just talking about shortage occupation, if you have a, if you have a sponsor license, you'll have seen um, emails from the Home Office telling you about the annual visa allocation process, which has now started from the beginning of this month. We can help you with that if, 
if, um, if, if, if you need it, but basically you want to try and ask for a request even if you don't have any immediate need so that you're covered for any urgent recruitment, particularly with extra Brexit related demand. Po possibly from the start of 2021, you'll also need to sponsor in tier two for European citizens for the first time as well, um, depending on what that new immigration system looks like. As we get through the years, do spend some time to try and understand the new system that will start from January next year. It will be a radical overhaul, we expect, of the current rules. And of course, for the first time, European workers are going to need to apply for visas when they come to the UK. So that will be a different, a different mindset. Um, it, it's possible that for certainly for lower skilled roles for European citizens, there may not be a route for them, or at least not a permanent route for them. There may be a temporary route where they can come for a year or two, but not. But, but it, it might be that the restrictions on on them staying permanently. And then I think I think it's passing on the message as we as we close now, and I hand back to Paul uh, within the hiring business that. Um, that visa costs and uh, lead-in time for recruitment may well, may well increase for next year when, when you're looking at bringing in European workers into the UK. Um, budgets obviously need to factor in potentially higher visa costs uh, for, for recruitment where you wouldn't have had to pay for those before. Paul. Okay, thanks Charlie, it's really interesting. And whatever your views on Brexit, I think what, what, what is absolutely clear from, from this government is that they want to make the UK the place in Europe for, for investment, particularly in the tech and life sciences sector. Opening up the immigration process and essentially meaning that anybody with tech, engineering or life sciences skills will be able to get um, a visa to come over here as a real way of, um, of, of, of helping. There is also, there's going to be an employment bill um, which is going to amend employment law that's going to be published sometime over the next few months. We don't know when, but that is set to, to, uh, to apparently change employment law in other ways than those that we've discussed that will, that will set out to be business, more business friendly, but at the same time protecting workers' rights. So how that balance is struck, we will wait to see. Uh, certainly very interesting times and of course as most people who know the UK is already um, the most flexible in terms of employment laws across, uh, across Europe as it is. I know a lot of companies that have thought about setting up in the Netherlands for example following Brexit have been really shocked to discover that you can't fire anyone even if they're a poor performer without going to court and getting a court order or that in Ireland people can get up to two years remuneration for unfair dismissal um, if you fire them after they've got um, just one year of service. So it's, um, it, I, I suspect the UK is going to continue to, to well, will grow as the place to invest in, 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 in Europe, even outside the EU. We do have a question that's come through on the, the new IR35 rule. So, Zainab, uh, we, we, we've been asked, when it, 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 do, do the IR35 rules also apply to the UK branch of a US LLC? The UK branch on its own is small, but if you combine the two entities um, and it would not come within the small company exemption, um, what happens there? Yes. Um, so, I mean, if, if it's one entity we're talking about, so if it's the, if the US LLC and the UK branch is one entity and um, and and, to, and you know the, they meet the um, it meets the definition of a small business then um, then it, it wouldn't fall within the RI thirty five rules if it um, so it, it's it's really looking at whether it's a separate UK entity or not if it's um, if it's a separate UK entity and the UK entity itself meets the definition of a small business and the US company also meets the definition then it would fall outside of the the rules. Um, and then equally, if, if the UK um, entity is a small business and the US um, company is a separate entity and it's not a small business, then um, the IR35 rules would apply to the yeah. UK entity. Exactly. So basically, you would have to look at the pair of branches because they're strictly speaking all one entity, then you wouldn't normally combine. You don't combine with a parent and a subsidiary, two separate legal entities, you just look then at the parent. Okay, and that's the only question.
question that we've had through. If you do have any more questions, feel free to contact any of the speakers, all of whose details are on the, that last slide. The slides will be emailed to everyone who's registered. I hope you found that useful, and I look forward to um, speaking to you in our next Employment and Immigration webinar. Thank you.